So I think I'm in a position where there's a huge misunderstanding in regard to the media management of news surrounding Xbox versus PlayStation. In this video, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about what I think some people are perceiving whenever we talk about this particular mismanagement in terms of media reporting. Now, I've made a series of videos that I called the Xbox tax where I showed clear examples of what I consider that to be. The media is biased towards what Xbox is doing, while at the same time, PlayStation gets treated with soft gloves. This is obvious with many examples, and I put it in a playlist of which I've basically demonstrated a few, but I decided to cap it off and kind of hold off for the meantime because, like clockwork, I believe that the media is going to also still slip up. Because one thing about what I've done is I've actually brought some examples from just the past year, but I'm looking forward to the media making the exact same mistake in this coming year so that I could just point it out with ease. It's not going to be too difficult to do simply because I understand the dynamics in a specific kind of way. Now, here's what I think a lot of people are reading into this whole conversation. Some folk are reading that when we say this, that we're talking about Xbox having been a very solid gaming platform for the last few years and the media just doesn't like them regardless of what they're doing. That's not what we're saying. In fact, I think that's probably an inadvertent deflection from those who are actually thinking or seeing it that way. It's not what we're saying. In fact, let me prove to you that that's not what I'm saying. And it's very easy to do because in this period that you're talking about the past few years about what Xbox was doing or whatnot, I was not playing games on Xbox. I never owned an Xbox. I was a PlayStation player. And in 2016, I went back to PC, but still maintained my PlayStation account, still played games on PlayStation, kept my PlayStation for exclusives. I remember even after building like a really solid rig, I think I'd upgraded to a solid rig at this point because my first build was like a real cheapo one. I remember still going to buy the PlayStation 4 Pro God of War edition, the used one. I, was, I went and traded my, my working PS4 for a PS4 Pro. Imagine me, a PC aficionado, actually upgrading console hardware. That's how much I actually did like the PlayStation proposition at the time. However, I saw that that proposition basically was, you know, basic was PlayStation taking advantage of those of us who enjoyed their platform. And I was like, man, I'm disillusioned by this. And I backed away. If at this point you're a PlayStation fan and you don't understand why I would have done that, that's OK, because you're not me. I'm not you. Does that make sense? So I backed away and I decided, well, I'm going to keep my, you know, my PlayStation participation limited. But then when the PS5 came out, I went ahead and got myself one. So I couldn't even tell you if Xbox was doing anything at that time that was relevant to me because it wasn't. They weren't doing anything that was captivating. They weren't doing anything that was interesting. Their games I was not interested in. They were not, you know, in my opinion anyways, attractive. I just looked at Xbox as a whole and I was like, this doesn't even work out for me. And I played other games. I played third-party games. I covered Tom Clancy's The Division 1 and The Division 2 from 2016 even till date. I was basically playing a Ubisoft game at this time. So nothing Xbox was doing was actually bothering me or actually making me to you know, take a second glance. However, in the last few years, things have changed. And with the change of these things, I think these propositions are interesting because it's very difficult for anybody who is looking at this from an objective perspective to actually deny that Xbox has taken a very interesting turn. A lot of the interesting turns that they've taken have been because of the circumstances that have basically plagued them. Their lack of providing, you know, something that was attractive to gamers like me on the PlayStation side or on the fence wanting to go to PC. This is what I've been talking about for the last few years that the media has not managed very well, but have instead put Xbox on this level of scrutiny that you basically cannot think that what they're doing is good anymore simply because those folk in the press, I don't know what their problem is. I think for some strange reason, Xbox must have hurt them personally that they seem to basically take out everything that's basically bad happening in the gaming industry on the company. Not saying that Xbox needs anybody to come to their help or come to their aid, but it's actually just kind of interesting at the end of the day when you take into account what must be going on. The very first thing that I think Xbox is doing now is actually making Game Pass as number one and putting games on Game Pass that serve their consumer base. This is a pro-consumer move. This is attractive for me and other gamers. I removed my subscription from Game Pass Ultimate because I had it and I got an Xbox to use as a development kit. So I said, why not? Why not use the Ultimate plan? It was actually, you know, not too bad when they raised the price, paid for one month, canceled it, but I got Game Pass on PC. So now they're offering me, a PC player, an option to also play their games. 
Many of you may or may not know, Game Pass used to have offerings that were separate for the console players that were not available for PC players. Now, they've basically gone ahead to pretty much put everything out there for everybody. So you pretty much have, depending on the tier that you are, you're going to have access to the games that they're bringing out, you know, on their platform. This is an improvement from the Game Pass of 2017 when it first came out. Because the Game Pass of 2017, I got that $1 deal and I just still looked and said, man, what is on this platform? Even though I saw the proposition, I was like, wow, this is interesting. This is something that really makes sense for a lot of people who want to actually play a library of games instead of paying $70. But the conversation around Game Pass is just quite weird. It's unsustainable. It's bad for the industry. It's going to harm games. It's anti-competitive. All this stuff. And I'm like, when I ask people, show me how this is anti-competitive, how this is unsustainable from, you know, for the, you know, for the gaming scene, their arguments really make no mathematical or economic sense at the end of the day. And these are the things that I'm pointing out, saying that there is a bias, because if PlayStation actually had a thing like Game Pass, I'd have kept my PlayStation console. I'd be making the same exact videos because I think it's a good proposition, regardless of who is doing it. What I see here is some people cannot see past the Xbox logo attached to Game Pass in their minds. They're still looking at the Xbox of, you know, the Xbox one generation and basically judging and wrapping this same Xbox with that same moniker. Xbox basically finds themselves in a precarious situation. So they go ahead and they get their Bethesda games, you know, because PlayStation is trying to, you know, pretty much money hat these games, right? That's how they got Bethesda. I mean, I'm sure some of you do know that. It seemed like, you know, PlayStation was going to pretty much money hat them out of relevance. And they decided that, man, they were just going to go ahead and buy Bethesda at the end of the day. It just didn't make any sense for them to lose out on this particular, you know, ecosystem that was bringing games to their platform. They bought Bethesda and immediately threw all Bethesda games on here. A good thing. They didn't make you kind of like, you know, wait or guess or try to charge you for it. Yes, they raised the price after the Call of Duty thing. I mean, well, actually, I thought Bethesda and in between Activision or whatever. But they brought the games to you, basically showing you that there was value in this system. And so now you, if you're in the Xbox ecosystem, you have this as a secondary option. Also, they were in a position where Activision's boss was trying to knock them out of Call of Duty. Many of you remember this. Don't pretend like you don't know. Somebody was telling me that Xbox went ahead and bought, the, you know, a third of the gaming industry, one of my audience members, and dumped on Game Pass. You act like Xbox really did want to spend that money. If it wasn't for the situation that they were in where Activision's boss, Bobby, was going to them and basically trying to shake them down to tell them, hey, man, if you guys don't put up and give us a higher profit share, we're going to take this game off your platform. That's how they found themselves in this situation. And they looked and said, sure, let's just go ahead and buy the darn thing, because apparently Sony is money hatting and we can outspend them in the business if that's how they want to go. And they brought it to Game Pass. So if we can't talk about the good things Xbox is doing in terms of being pro consumer, when we can talk about the good things PlayStation does, we're in a situation where we will never be able to have any good outlook of the gaming industry or see where things are going. They've been able to bring this system everywhere that you can possibly get it with your hands. You can play games on in your Tesla. You can play games on your fridge if the thing supports freaking Game Pass. You can play it on your TV. But people consider this to be a bad thing. Oh, the Xbox console is dead. Yo, they weren't selling the consoles anyways. What were they supposed to do? The PlayStation people said they weren't buying the console, so they decided, well, let's just go put the games everywhere that we can. And then they started bringing their games to PC day one. This, to me, was a good thing, because now gamers have options to play games where they want to play. PlayStation has done the same thing. Is anybody dying about it? Oh, wait, it's because it's not day and date. PlayStation is now bringing games day and date. Oh, wait, it's not their marquee games. Oh, PlayStation is now bringing some of their published games day and date. Oh, wait, it's Lego. So Lego basically told PlayStation that it had to be, you know, a multi-plat deal or whatever. I, I just all these excuses when in reality, the industry is changing right before our eyes. And so when I say that there's a bias against Xbox, some people think I mean that Xbox has been doing great things all these years. No, it wasn't until like the last few years that they kind of snapped into it. And in seeing that, I'm like, wow, this actually makes a difference in the industry. So we must be able to talk about these things. We must be able to point them out for what they are, simply because I know that if PlayStation was doing those things, I would be sharing those things as well as pro consumer, regardless of the box or the platform that it was on. 
even I myself, as somebody who plays on PC who does not like exclusivity, you'll see me here on Epic Games where I will criticize Epic Games and praise them in one click. It's weird. The Epic Games Store is, you know, the one that brings some games as, you know, part timed exclus exclusives away from other PC platforms. And Epic Games is not liked for this. Everybody cannot stand the fact that they do this. However, I'm an indie developer. Unreal Engine is huge. They take a lot of that Fortnite money and they give away all kinds of stuff. Every month, they're putting free assets that you can use as a game developer to pretty much work on your projects. They give you an engine that's a multi-million dollar piece of software to use to basically build your projects up front. To me, there is nothing more pro developer than this. However, knowing that this, their money hatting is anti-consumer, I'll criticize them for it. You hear it from me in the very same vein. And so this is how we must have these conversations in looking at what is good and what is what is not good. Because Unreal Engine is actually not only pro developer, it's also pro consumer. This Black Myth Wukong that everybody is shouting about, Game Science would have had to basically go pay for another engine to do this or pay to build your own engine and then support their own engine to be able to make a game like Black Myth Wukong. Because a game like this would require a lot of technology to be able to pull off. But to be able to get it for free, to me, I think there's no... That's why we're here. I mean, that's why we're having these conversations. That's why consumers got a game on a triple... Even if it's a triple A game that is actually on par with the, with the, you know, the presentation and the looks. Now, performance is a whole different, you know, conversation. But that's big. That's huge. Epic Games can now learn, that, okay, how do our games work in these scenarios? Because they've only used this engine to make Fortnite and Paragon. Well, that's Unreal Engine 4, which is almost the same thing. And so now they can basically see what their games are challenging to do. I've always thought, and let me just be honest with you, I thought Ep Unreal Engine was just not the best game to make melee action games. Well, apparently people are pushing it all the way there. It actually is a game that can make good melee action games, it can make good shooters, been making Gears of War, and all of that stuff. So the gaming industry requires a very good outlook where people can divorce their emotions from whichever box they're playing on. Yes, we all take pride where we play. Yes, we all like to play certain games in certain ways. However, if we cannot talk about what is good because we cloud our judgment with what we perceived as bad in the past, we're not going to advance. We're not going to advance. We're going to be stuck in a rut. The Internet is full of people that are just posting whatever they want to post because in their minds, they feel like these criticisms, you know, or they call them, you know, and forgive my language, poop posts. I'm going to use the more cleaner term. And they think that's going to somehow change the industry. No, what will change the industry is when we are actually thinking and ob observant of the things that are great and actually support them and have good nuanced conversations because we know the layers of complexity that actually guide a lot of this stuff in the gaming scene. So if we're not going to have these, in these conversations and in as intelligent conversations, but instead we want to console war and list war and score points war, then you're going to be in the same place you are. In fact, right now, because of how pro-consumer Xbox is, They've basically taken the lead from PlayStation in terms of relevance. Do you know how I know? Who's talking about PlayStation anymore? No one. It doesn't matter what PlayStation tries to do. No one is talking about them because there's nothing new that they're doing. There's nothing inherently pro-consumer that they're dealing with. It's just the same old PlayStation. Not being innovative while their competitor has basically blazed the trail in creating value for their customers. And they're just basically sitting there, money hiding games, doing old school practices. That's not going to last very long. Do you know why? These games eventually come to Xbox and almost most of them come to PC. So by the time gamers start seeing this and going like, man, why am I even bothering with a platform that is inferior in hardware, charges me money to, pay, to play online, you know, and I can get better hardware for, you know, less money or about the same and I don't deal with these costs. People are going to start waking up and leaving that platform and its proposition is not going to have any way to cause an effect. Whereas Xbox has its own ways to actually create an effect along the way. So those who are basically saying, oh, you know, the hardware sales and, you know, you don't need hardware to actually have good consumer, you know, offerings. Steam is a good example of that. Steam is a perfect example of that. They barely have any hardware. They barely had, hard, had hardware for, you know, the longest time. The Steam Deck basically came in as just revolutionizing the industry, but they've had a solid offering for the longest time. And they made Steam just so that they could sell their own game. That's how Steam started. And now everybody wants to bring their game to Steam. 
So I think the way that we look at the gaming industry really needs to take a very, very deep, uh, you know, a very deep look at how we are actually approaching things. Console wars are stupid. Exclusivities are dead. There's no need to be bothering with it. If for some people you took pride in the platform you played on because of exclusivity, you need to basically change your outlook because that's all going to go away. Because not a lot of people are playing games the way that we thought. The new generation of kids, I said this in a video a while back. I said the new generation of kids, they're going to surprise you. They're not really big on console. They like PC. You don't understand. <laughs> and I, I can't give you too much information as to how I actually came to that conclusion. Some of you might know. You might be able to deduce it with other statements that I've said. But it's going to surprise you when it comes down to it. And PlayStation knows it. They understand this. Some people will tell you, well, parents are not going to buy PCs for their kids. Really? Okay, then what data would Steam have actually had access to that they would actually do a family, you know, a, a Steam family sharing where you can share games with your kids? Where do they get that data from? Thanks for watching. Peace out.